For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. More than two weeks have passed since local police and masked gunmen opened fire on a group of students killing six. 43 of the students then seemingly disappeared. Today, angry protesters torched the state's capital's government palace. They are furious that officials have not revealed any new information about the investigation into the crime. As protests continue, some intended victims are lucky to be alive. Our correspondent Clayton Kahn brings us the latest. Today begins a 48-hour strike of students by Mexico's largest public university, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, or UNAM, in solidarity with the families and classmates of the 43 forcibly disappeared students from the Ayotzinapa Teachers Training College in the state of Guerrero. As we recall, the students were attacked and presumably disappeared by at least dozens of agents of the municipal police in the town of Iguala on September 26. Various mobilizations and actions are expected to occur throughout the country as widespread clamor continues to grow over how federal and Guerrero state authorities are handling the case. Yesterday, students, teachers, and family that disappeared occupied the state congress building and mayor's office in the Guerrero state capital, Chilpancingo, demanding the return alive of the students, the destitution of the state governor, Angela Aguirre, and the detention and prosecution of Iguala Mayor Jose, Jose Luis Abarca, who remains a fugitive. And thanks to Clayton. Bolivian President Evo Morales says he will not seek another term after his concludes. He concludes his mandate in 2020. Bolivians re-elected Morales on Sunday. The Bolivian Election Authority projects that Morales will win re-election with 55% of the vote. 60% of the ballots have officially been counted. His closest rival, right-wing businessman Samuel Doria Medina, Gardner garnered only 30% of the vote. Morales also says he has never even considered an attempt to change the Constitution to allow him to stand for another term. He adds that by the year 2020, he would be looking forward to returning to his hometown in a rural area of the country. Morales revealed more plans for his next term in office. He plans to issue decrees financing the operation of safe houses for women who are victims of domestic violence. And to Brazil, President Dilma Rousseff's Workers' Party revealed internal polls today that show she has widened her lead ahead of the country's second round of voting. The survey puts Rousseff in the lead with 47% support. That's an, incre an increase from earlier polls, which gave Rousseff 45% of the vote and her rival, Aécio Neves, 44%. Rousseff continues to warn that Neves' economic policies would be a devastation for the country. She adds that her rival's economic, that his economic proposals will deepen the inequality left behind by his party over 12 years ago. Central America was rattled by a strong earthquake underwater off the Pacific coast of El Salvador late Monday night. There was concern of the possibility of a tsunami, but authorities later said there was no risk. Power outages were reported in El Salvador, Nicaragua. Nicaragua ordered schools closed today. Our correspondent Gerardo Torres has been covering the developments all day. A 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck last night the Pacific coast of Central America and was felt throughout all the territory. According to the Seismic Stations Network, until now more than 10 aftershocks have been registered, the strongest one with an intensity of 4.1 degrees. The epicenter of the earthquake was at 67 kilometers west-southwest of Jiquilillo in Nicaragua and 174 kilometers southeast of El Salvador. Authorities have only informed about one person dead as consequence of the earthquake in the municipality of San Miguel in El Salvador. Even though last night there was a possible tsunami alert, a couple hours later it was dismissed by authorities. Only few damages have been reported in the infrastructure of some cities in the coastal area. Gerardo Torres, Telesur, Central America. And thanks to Gerardo, UN Secretary ban General Ban Ki-moon has arrived to see for himself the destruction after Israel's 50-day attacks on the Gaza Strip. An estimated 20,000 homes were destroyed. Over 2,100 people were killed, most of them civilians, including children, women, and the elderly. Moon's visit coincides with the arrival of over 75 trucks of reconstruction aid. With more, here's our correspondent, Noor Harazin. In a historic event in the Gaza Strip, United Nations Chief Ban Ki-moon made a brief visit Tuesday to the coastal enclave, two days after donor states pledged $5.4 billion in aid to rebuild after a devastating Israeli offensive. 
Ban Ki-moon was driven through the ruins of Gaza City's Chijaiya neighborhood and the nearby Jebalia refugee camp, two of the most affected areas during Israel's ground invasion, to witness the scenes of some of the heaviest shelling in Israel's military assault. Uh, this is my third visit to Gaza, uh, but uh, I wanted to visit last time, last July, when I was uh, visiting the region. But at that time, I was not able to visit because of the continuing violence. Uh, I'm here uh, to send my uh, strong solidarity and support to the people of Palestine. Before I say a few words, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to express my deepest condolences to all those people who lost their lives and uh, to family members who, who lost their loved ones and family members. The destruction which I have seen while coming to here is uh, beyond the description. Ban Ki-moon, who last visited the territory in 2012, said at a donor conference in Egypt on Sunday that his trip to the Palestinian enclave was to listen directly to the people of Gaza. During his visit, UN chief met with members of the new Palestinian government alongside officials from several Palestinian parties to discuss the current situation in the Gaza Strip in order to implement plans of easing life on the ground and help affected families immediately. Noor Harazin, Telesu TV, Gaza. And thanks to Noor. In France, Foreign Minister Louha Fabiou says his government would consider the recognition of a Palestinian state only if it is helpful to peace. His statement comes after the UK Parliament voted in favor of a symbolic recognition of the Palestinian state in an effort to pressure Prime Minister David Cameron to do the same. The Swedish government will also recognize the Palestinian state. Fabius didn't rule out a similar measure for France. We are working in this state of mind with all concerned parties and notably with the Palestinians. That means that we will not only act in a symbolic way, but to be useful for peace. And I confirm that when the time is right, there will be a recognition of the Palestinian state. The World Health Organization has warned that the Ebola virus is now killing 70% of the people who are infected with it. It added that by December 10th, by December 10th, thousands of new victims could contract the disease per week. Over 4,000 people have died so far due to the epidemic in West Africa. The disease continues to expand geographically. There are more um, uh, district counties and prefectures that actually have disease than there would have been a month ago. Um, and it's happening in all three countries. The U.S. has ramped up airstrikes against the Islamic State extremists in the Syrian border town of Kobani. This Kurdish town has been submerged in chaos and intense fighting as ISIS has taken control of up to 40 percent of the enclave. The increase in U.S.-led attacks shows that Washington has changed its mind about how important it is to avoid the Islamic State fighters take over Kobani. President Obama spoke today to defense chiefs from more than 20 coalition countries saying he is deeply concerned about the advance of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. He is facing difficult new options to bolster allies in as he weighs the recommendations for tougher action. Experts have said he must worry that because of the deteriorating situation, he's being pushed down the very path he had hoped to avoid, which is sending U.S. ground troops into Iraq and possibly Syria. The leader of Spain's Catalonia region, Artur Mas, today said despite that the referendum on independence has been blocked by objections from Madrid, the region would go ahead with November 9 vote with a non-binding vote on succession. Artur Mas had earlier said the referendum was canceled, but in his latest act of defiance toward the Spanish government of Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy, the Catalan leader announced his government would urge citizens to take part in the consolation. He added that his government had the right to organize such an expression of popular will and that doing so would not violate Spanish law. We now go to London where locals and tourists are flocking to the National Gallery for an advanced viewing of a Rembrandt exhibition which includes his latest works. The exhibition features works rarely ever seen before in public. The event is a unique opportunity for people to explore Rembrandt's final years 
from about 1652 until his death in 1669. This era has been described as a remarkably fruitful period for the artist by expert and curator Betsy Wiseman. This is the first exhibition devoted to Rembrandt's final years. Every work in the exhibition is by the artist himself to get a better understanding of his style and technique. The exhibition includes many works rarely seen in public, um, paintings